attendees are muted by all attendees are muted by default, but please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A functions. And just for the recording, uh, welcome to session three of the Bit Creator Forum. I'm Kari Smith, she, her pronouns, and I'm part of this year's forum committee. I have the pleasure to be moderating the session today. In addition, Brian Dietz is the Code of Conduct Monitor, Nancy will be on tech support duties for presenters, and Jess is our slide wrangler. Alice Prill will be handling the Q&A at the end. The session has two 20-minute presentations, after which we look forward to having a very engaging Q&A discussion. If you have any questions for the presenters, please use the Q&A feature and drop your questions in there as they come to you. You can choose to ask a question anonymously also if you choose. The presentation is recorded and the Q&A will also be recorded along with the chat and these will be made available to you after the forum. So that's all the housekeeping notes I have. Without further ado, let's get going with our session. Our first presentation is Exploring Good Enough, Using NDSA Levels of Preservation to Establish a Shared Standard. And the presentations today will be done by um, Brina Edwards, Hui Young Kim, and Christy Toms, all from the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you very much and um, welcome to your presentation. Uh, the next slide, please. Hi everyone, we are the co-facilitators or showrunners for the University of Texas at Austin Digital Preservation Group known as UT DigiPres. We are presenting how we use the National Digital Stewardship Alliance or NDSA levels of digital preservation as a guide to help with assessing digital preservation efforts and where we want to be realistically or good enough campus-wide based on our individual institutional resources. UT DigiPres was created to be a forum to share information and common concerns related to digital preservation at the University of Texas at Austin for all staff. We have 78 members on our listserv. We are a diverse group of digital preservation stakeholders ranging in repository size and our primary type of digital asset. My repository, the Stark Center, is small and our primary digital asset are digitized materials whereas the Harry Ransom Center and the Briscoe Center are larger repositories with their primary digital assets being both born digital and digitized materials. The University of Texas at Austin library system, which include their special libraries, are also a larger repository, but their primary digital assets are digital digitized materials. We also have the Texas Digital Library and Information School students as members, and even though they don't have digital repositories, they do have a vested interest and digital preservation at the University of Texas at Austin. Next slide, please. The UT DigiPres group was created in 2011 and in 2019 was paused due to staffing changes at the participating institutions. The group was reformed, reformed in 2021. To determine what topic to start the first to stop off, start off the first season, the showrunners Set out, sent out a survey to all members to find out what they would be interested in talking about. 20 members responded to the survey. Due to limited time to prepare for the first season topic, the showrunners chose to go with show and tell current work topic. Each showrunner gave a presentation on a digital preservation project they were working on and had a Q&A at the end. For season two, the topic of digital preservation self-assessment was suggested. So with more time to plan and prepare for season two, the topic of digital preservation assessment evolved into creating a shared digital preservation standard through self-assessment. Next slide, please. Um, on your screen, you see the NDSA levels of digital, sorry, <laughs> the NDSA levels of digital preservation version two matrix. Along the left side is the functional areas of digital preservation. And along the top, you will find the levels from one to four. On the NDSA levels of digital preservation webpage, you can find um, the version two matrix, working definitions, implementation of guidelines and assessment tools. The next few slides will be presented by Brenna. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. So, after hearing our initial goals for the uh, 
establishing an institutional shared standard, you may be asking, well, how did you do it? So what the showrunners did is we set out to create the season um, all at once and sort of plan ahead and then be willing to change as we went. So to do that, we had the goals from the outset of to create an interactive space for the people in our group and encourage them to contribute while also making the meetings effective and conversational rather than just talking at people. We wanted people to really engage with us. We also wanted to create not only the good enough shared standard across campus, we wanted to create and build up this community that existed and turn it more into a shared community and a safe space for both practitioners and students to learn and ask questions and not feel like judged for that. So those were our two main goals. And uh, next slide, please. <laughs> One way we did this was by, as I mentioned, structuring out our entire season from the get-go. Um, the other showrunners and I worked really hard to make sure we had defined goals for each time we met. Uh, the top level that you can see with the yellow sticky notes are the main group meetings we had. They were bi-monthly. And then we also had, uh, as you can see in the bottom sticky notes in blue, um, optional meetings to keep work going. So the first two months, September and November, we really focused on the levels of devil, digital preservation in saying, where were we at the time? And why were we at the level we were at? What processes we were in? Um, essentially the how of how did we get to where we were then. And we sort of labeled that the assessment period. And then in January and March of this year, so just a few weeks ago, um, is what we termed our decision-making sessions of coming together and talking through our common minimum goals that we could uh, realistically achieve. And Young's going to talk about that later on. Um, and then in March, we did a wrap up session to sort of go over like, this is what we've decided. This is what we wanted to do. And also brainstorm for our next season. Uh, the optional groups were focused on doing a deeper reading of the levels while also looking at other workflows and policies out in the digital archives world. Um, and also just doing a check-in to see where we were um, at that time after deciding the common minimum. And that is something we plan to implement going forward and having um, small check-ins at each of our bi-monthly meetings and also just uh, random meetings uh, throughout the months just be like, hey, how's it going? What do you need help with? What do you need to... What do you need from us that might be useful to help you accomplish your goals? And so really structuring that out and helping it and being flexible where people were, but people seem to really like this. So um, the emojis, uh, the grimacing emoji, and then the uh, party emoji on either side of the sticky note um, represent the co-facilitator meetings that happened. Um, and that we were kind of nervous uh, before each meeting because we just wanted to make sure Sure, like things would go well and that we would create this community and this interaction that we wanted. And then um, as you can imagine at the end, it's like, oh yeah, that was fine. Uh, actually that may have went better than expected, hence the party emoji. Um, so yeah, and next slide, please. Some of the tools we used um, include when to meet uh, to help schedule our meetings instead of having a set meeting every single month. Um, we made it adjustable so that people to account for people's schedules that may change month to month, or maybe they have a meeting canceled one month and they want to come to ours instead. Um, and we chose it over Doodle just for because we like the interface better and it could you could see all the options at once, um, which is a little bit harder with Doodle now. Um, the main tool that we used is uh, a product called Google Jamboard. It is a product uh, within the Google suite of tools and it allows for anonymous interaction and um, 
lots of sticky notes and text and highlights. Um, we used it to track our progress. Each, we broke down each of the uh, different categories that you could measure a level for in the levels and uh, lots of sticky notes on each page about where we were, why we were there, and where we ended up being with our good enough standard, as well as the um, commentary and like, hey, this is something we should think about. Um, a few challenges we had with that is that it only has 20 slides available. Um, after that, you can't make any more. So once we started doing the optional meetings and we wanted to record some of that work, we had to get a little creative on how we squish things down to make sure things were going to all fit and be a full, complete record of this process. The knowns and knowns matrix is another is another way we um, use to challenge ourselves to think about the levels differently. Um, you can see an example of it up in the top right. It's used more in corporate business settings and um, goals for the years. Um, some things for the unknown unknown matrix, for example, was the future of storage technology and if automation is going to be used. Um, it was a really good exercise to sort of figure out what we have control over, what we don't have control over, and how it can be used throughout. Um, and then finally, we also used Microsoft Teams um, to do a lot of communication and planning for uh, the showrunners and also sharing documents and conversations amongst the larger group to share resources on campus for recycling materials responsibly and for um, making plans and sharing other events. And now I'm going to pass it to Young, who's going to talk about um, where we ended up. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Brenna. Um, let's check where the group landed after our meetings. And as you can see here, we settled on level one for all of our functional areas. This was not a surprise because during the assessment period, everyone was reporting that they were somewhere between level zero to level two. And moreover, the group's goal has been to arrive at a shared good enough standard that all of the participating institution can agree on. And to be honest, we were worried that even level one could be aspirational because, again, during the assessment period, we found that everyone had a weakest link in their workflow. And regardless of the institution's size, overcoming them was not easy. It is because bigger institutions had more complex problems to solve and smaller institutions had less resource to fix problems. Now, you'll notice some cells in level two are partially highlighted. These were the areas where the group was being strategically <laughs> ambitious. And um, during the decision-making period, we try to identify some low-hanging items in the next levels. So for example, in the control functional area, we all wanted to do, that, do more than just level one that was determining who does what. So we dabbled into level two and decided to start the documentation for who does what. Um, we are very proud that different size institutions were able to arrive at an agreement, as well as we are excited to have a clear defined digital preservation objectives that we can work towards coming months. Next slide, please. And um, now that the group has wrapped up the season, we had a chance to sit down and reflect on, on how the season went. And of course, us being the showrunners, logistic lessons were forefront in our minds. Um, we believe this season was successful thanks to planning out the arc fully in advance. Um, knowing where the group was headed um, not only helped us to be confident in leading the season, but also helped the group members to feel that they are contributing to something bigger. However, I mean, everyone has a plan until that get, they get punched, right? Um, and that's exactly why we having us having situation room meetings before and after main meetings were very important. That was a lot of meetings, like 14 additional meetings for us, but it allowed us to set and adjust goals based as we go, as well as um, be realistic for each group meetings. And speaking of being realistic, having an optional group meetings was a brilliant idea. We think it prevented burnouts and maintained the group's engagement high throughout the season. And another lesson we learned was fully immersing yourself. Of course, we all heard about NDSA's levels of digital preservation at some point in our career, and we all thought, 
I should do something with it. And now I have to tell you, it was only when I sat down and read the table and glossary line by line, share my assessment with the group and learned about how other folks did their assessment. That's when I was able to see all the different ways um, everyone is meeting the levels. And after that, I was finally able to act on it. So something to think about. And that being said, next slide, please. Um, what's next? Well, for you, uh, we believe you should strongly consider starting, joining, or taking over a local digital preservation group. And oh, I can already see some angry comments and email headed my way. So let me answer a few of them right now. What good will it do? Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, I think it can be an opportunity to finally get things done. These things could be for you, for your institution, or for everyone in your community. And then who will come? Well, surprisingly a lot. Based on our interaction, we believe many of us are all lost together in the maze of digital preservation. And when we are all trying to find a path together, and yes, I know what I'm about to say is a cliche, but having a support group that uplifts you does have a huge difference, um, does make a huge difference in your day-to-day -day work. And lastly, um, I don't have time. Um, looks like, oh, where irony, looks like I don't have time either. So next slide, please. Um, I'll just share a few of my favorite resources on making time and I'll pause here for a second. So you can take a screenshot and I'll also try to drop the links in the chat as well. And if you know, want to know why I chose this, um, feel free to ask later during the Q&A. And moving on. Next slide, please. All right, as for us, the group had a season two finale meeting on March 20th, and we are excited. Uh, we received great feedbacks and suggestions from the group members, and we're now looking into uh, which topic will make the most impact for the group next season. So um, if season three goes well, uh, we will definitely share how it went in 2024. And that's all. Thank you, everyone. And if you have questions or feedback, feel free to share them during the Q&A or reach out to us. Thank you very much, uh, Christy, Young, and Breta uh, for your presentation there. Um, uh, as we mentioned before, you can use the Q&A uh, uh, for the webinar itself. Um, go ahead and put questions in now. And at the end, after um, Emmeline's uh, presentation, we'll do Q&A for both, uh, both presentations. So up next in session three is collaborative appraisal of Board Digital Archives. Uh, Emmeline Kayser from the University of Georgia. Emmeline, welcome to uh, the forum. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Emmeline Kayser. I'm a digital archivist at the University of Georgia, and today I'm going to be talking about collaborative appraisal of born digital archives. Slide, please. So born digital refers to files that were originally created in a digital environment. So in this case, I'm mostly going to be talking about donated materials from people's computers. Um, so outside of a records management context, there isn't a whole lot of literature that I've been able to find on appraising born digital archives. Uh, I think it can take a lot to get to the step where things are even preservable. So appraisal might not really be on the radar for a lot of organizations right now. Um, but there are some compelling reasons to appraise. Uh, born digital donations in particular can be kind of chaotic. Uh, they can be a little disorganized. They can often contain a lot of different formats that span sometimes different decades and operating systems. And appraisal provides a preliminary overview of the materials while the context and potentially even the donors are still fresh in archivist minds or available for even follow-up conversations if questions arise. Uh, it can also promote responsible storage management and energy usage as the volume of digital records grows. So digital archives, have some complications that make their ongoing preservation a little bit more active. So if you're already preserving digital archives, you might have or you likely have some form of, of ongoing storage expenses. Um, you might also have processes like integrity or fixity checks or format monitoring or even format migration. Um, and all of this work kind of multiplies over time for all of the files that you're preserving 
but don't actually want or need. So appraisal conserves those resources. And appraisal also allows archivists to factor formats and other complexities into the processing plan. And this is especially useful for donated collections um, where contents are not always known. So you can kind of get a sense of how organized the files are, um, whether there are any glaring concerns about sensitive or private information. And it's also important to be able to factor in format data at this stage, uh, because when it comes to processing labor, um, not, all, not all formats are created equal in that regard. And I think it's important to mention here as well um, that an archive needs to have legal rights to the material before it can make appraisal decisions. And that will become a little more relevant later on when I talk about appraisal as part of accessioning. Um, but first we can talk about a little case study. So I work on the digital stewardship team at the University of Georgia Libraries. I am the digital archivist for two different special collections libraries, the Hargret Library, which houses manuscripts and university archives, and the Russell Library, which houses primarily political collections. I've been here for about a year and a half, um, building out foreign digital workflows and also doing accessioning and processing work for these materials. So most of the born digital materials that I receive were donated as part of hybrid collections. So a mix of paper and digital. Uh, the size of these donations varies a lot, but it's typically a high volume of relatively small files and a variety of transfer media. And because we have so much older or and potentially unstable media, I try to get things copied off of their transfer media within four months of receipt. Um, and if you would like any more information about kind of our, our accessioning workflow, we do have public documentation on the UGA Libraries GitHub, which I think we can link in the chat. Thank you. Um, and that also includes a section on appraisal, uh, which is our topic today. So each library that I work with also has collecting archivists that are responsible for collecting decisions and most donor communications. And they usually bring in the materials and then hand them off to me to accession and process. So this meant that historically, um, I had kind of minimal context for the files that I was handling and the archivists had kind of minimal knowledge of what I was actually doing with the files once they were handed off. Uh, next slide. So in 2021, uh, we generated the first full format report out of our digital preservation system. And this report showed that beyond our most common file types, there was a super long tail of unusual file formats. And many of those formats were determined to be at potential risk for obsolescence. So our report identified a little over 200 formats, and that included um, some multiple identifications for the same files. So there was some inflation there, but even with that inflation, um, only about 10 of those formats represented 94% of our collection material. So that meant that we had <laughs> about 200 additional formats that we potentially needed to monitor, and they represented only about 6% of our collections. So when I looked into this 6% a little bit closer, um, it turned out that a lot of these files were things that we didn't actually want to keep. Uh, there were things like old executables, um, application data, and some kind of just other incidental files from the corners of donors' personal computing environments. And we're not currently working on emulating anybody's computer. So most of these files were just out of the collecting scope and they were giving us a ton of extra data points to monitor. So considering the amount of ongoing preservation work that digital materials require, uh, it was clear to me that we needed just a more comprehensive appraisal process. And this was the first time that the libraries had had the labor resources available to expand those processes. So it kind of seemed like the time was right. So I approach born digital appraisal as a two-phase process that addresses two distinct perspectives. Uh, one perspective or kind of phase of appraisal, I refer to as technical appraisal. And this involves assessing the material's technical usability and preservation needs. And it's largely based on format. Um, and this is also based on knowledge of digital preservation best practice and our current preservation capabilities as an organization. So as the digital archivist, I'm kind of in the best position to do this. 
Um, and it also anticipate I can also anticipate the kinds of processing work that certain files are going to require. The other perspective is content based, and this is grounded in collection expertise. Uh, so as I mentioned before, each library that I work with has collecting archivists that make collecting decisions, um, coordinate with donors. So they're the ones that, that kind of have the deep contextual knowledge um, and know which materials are gonna make the strongest collections. They also know what we need to keep and what researchers are going to find useful. Slide please. So if they are the collection experts and I have technical and digital preservation knowledge, the question emerged of how to combine those two different kinds of expertise. Uh, and if appraisal were to become a collaborative process, how do we integrate that into our workflows when everybody's already super busy? So with these questions in mind, um, I created our first collaborative appraisal workflow. It includes an iterative technical appraisal that I am responsible for and a content appraisal phase that the collecting archivist steps in for. So fortunately, my colleagues were pretty much on board with this idea from the start. It was mostly a matter of figuring out the logistics. So I, I think of technical appraisal as um, a way to remove kind of the digital quote unquote noise that may be surrounding the actual archival materials. Um, this removal saves space in our systems, and it also gives me an opportunity to look at the files with my digital preservation glasses on and determine how complex the materials are and how much work they're going to require. On the other hand, content appraisal gives the collecting archivist an opportunity to apply collection expertise to assess the files and remove any materials that are out of scope. So this flowchart um, is an overview of the collaborative appraisal workflow. I consider appraisal part of the accessioning process uh, because if a collection is gonna sit in a processing queue for a while before it's ingested, I wanna make sure that we're storing only the material that we intend to preserve. So this workflow starts after we've done um, our custodial due diligence to get files off of any transfer media get them fully documented, um, get them into our temporary storage systems. And as I mentioned before, um, legal rights are important here. So if a library accepts material without having all the paperwork signed, then it, we don't have a legal green, green light to fully accession and appraise material on, on our timeline. So that's something that, that has occasionally been a stumbling block. But, um, I have this little looping arrow here on the left that is supposed to indicate technical appraisal as an iterative process. Um, I have a list of criteria that I use to identify what can be appraised out up front. Uh, and there's also, also wanna do a shout out to Adrian Hansen, our head of digital stewardship, who created a fantastic format analysis Python script that is also on our GitHub page. Uh, and this script generates a format report that identifies the file types in an accession, it determines their risk level, and it flags particular formats or other key characteristics that I have determined may make something a potential technical appraisal candidate. So this kind of does an automated pass on these files and is able to aggregate certain data that I can then review. And this process of review and running these scripts can repeat multiple times depending on the size of the accession and if anything kind of anomalous comes up. And after that process, we are at the top of the right column. And at this point, I have looked through the materials. I can summarize any relevant information for the collecting archivist. So this can include areas with potentially sensitive information. So if I see a folder named taxes, um, files that look like they may be out of scope, um, or areas with a lot of at-risk or unknown formats that are going to require a lot of processing work. So I provide this information to the collecting archivist and this can be factored into their content appraisal decisions sort of as they see fit. And that's the orange box there. So once they've done that, um, the collection comes back to me 
and I determine a high level processing plan. And that kind of wraps up the appraisal process. So this is still um, quite new for us. It was a goal kind of from the beginning that this not create um, a huge burden on anybody's workload. And we're still navigating that and kind of trying to find the balance. Right now, I manage a Trello board that I share with the collecting archivists. And it has a card for each collection that I'm working on. So when I wrap up technical appraisal for a collection, I create a list of bulleted notes with any information that I think is going to be relevant to the next phase of appraisal. I put that as a comment on the collection card and I tag the collecting archivist so that they receive a notification. Um, I then assign them the card, which is a Trello functionality, and move the card to a specific list for their review. Uh, so that's kind of the system that we have right now. It's fully asynchronous. It seems to be effective so far, um, especially because it allows archivists to sort of tackle collections on their own schedule. Um, there is a risk there that uh, things can bottleneck at certain points, but there have also been instances where um, enough questions have arisen that I just ask for an in-person meeting to talk about or appraise a collection together. And these can be super effective, but it's not really the MO for most collections because it's also very time consuming and uh, people's calendars are very full. So generally we rely on asynchronous primarily. So looking forward, um, this is still in development. It is effectively addressing kind of the unwanted technical files and operating system data that was contributing to a lot of our format chaos um, in the beginning. It's also made our workflows more collaborative, which is a plus. And as we go forward, I, I just wanna make sure that it doesn't become a burdensome process with confusing or really spaced out communication, which I think can be a risk of this kind of asynchronous work. And I also wanna be wary of bottlenecks where work can kind of stack up in somebody's queue and potentially become overwhelming. Um, but my hope is that we can prevent this by continuing to talk to each other adjusting as needed and um, making sure that we're just in communication when our work overlaps. So thank you everybody for your time. Uh, my email address is on this slide. So please do reach out if you'd like to talk about this um, general born digital record appraisal or any kind of collaborative workflows. And uh, thank you to the facilitators. Thank you, Emmeline. Um, so we're now going to have a question and answer period. Uh, we've got um, a fair amount of time, so uh, which is really great. If you do have questions, you can drop them in that Q and A um, box down below uh, or the chat. Um, and Alice, uh, sorry, Alice is going to moderate um, the question and answers now. Thank you, Alice. Um, so first question in the Q and A for Emmeline. Uh, the collaborative appraisal process is almost exactly what we have tried to implement at our repository. Um, my question is bluntly, how do you get the collecting archivists to actually do their part? Have you had success with that? That's where the bottleneck is for us sitting down and looking through the files is just never a priority on their end. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that, yeah, that's that's one of the concerns is that that is one of those work bottlenecks where um, people who have a lot on their plate might have a hard time returning to uh, these kinds of born digital collections to look through them. There have been instances where if there is a time crunch that being able to get time on the calendar to talk about it has been the way to expedite that. But I realize it's not also not always possible um, with people's schedules. So I have been using the Trello notification um, functionality is actually really useful for this because you can ping people to remind them. Um, we're also thinking about implementing, trying to implement some kind of schedule. This is not something that we've done yet, but the idea of kind of having like a window for how long we want things to sit in certain um, queues. So we haven't gotten to that point yet where we need to implement a specific schedule, but that's also something to consider is just agreeing on 
a window of however many months that something can be in one place. And an advantage of Trello as well is it puts timestamps on whenever things are moved from one phase to the next. So you can put reminders and dates and sort of see when, when something got moved from one stage to the next. But yeah, people, people are super busy, so that can be hard. Well, thank you. Um, I actually have a question while folks are adding to the Q&A. Um, also for Emily, are you collecting information about what's being appraised out to inform or automate future appraisal? I know TerraCopy has an ignore uh, list that can, can use file extensions and, and file names. So uh, just interested in like how you, if you're collecting information for that. Yes, so I currently um, create an initial manifest of all of the files that we receive in a digital accession. So this manifest includes full file path, um, like a MD5 checksum, and size information and date information. And I have this run as a script, so we get this information for everything that we acquire. Um, once the technical appraisal process happens. I have a second script that runs again and compares what is left in the accession with what is in that manifest that was initially created. So it creates like an automatic appraisal log. And then I can go in and add notes with um, reasoning for why certain things were removed sort of as needed. Excellent, thank you. Um, question from the Q&A, are you storing the FITS results, technical metadata, along with the files? Oh, sorry, was that a question for me? Um, it didn't specify, but I think so, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, certainly. Um, are you storing the FITS results, technical metadata, along with the files? Yes, we do currently store the FITS results. Um, the script that we use, the format analysis script, generates FITS data for every file in an accession that's sort of saved in its own directory. And it also is aggregated in a format report. So that is primarily what we, what we would save if something were to, you know, be sitting in a processing queue for longer, we wouldn't nece necessarily need to save, um, you know, tens of thousands of individual FITS files or FITS outputs. It would be aggregated into um, an Excel file in that format report. So we do have that data. Excellent, thank you. Um, I also, I have a question for uh, Brenna, Young, and Christy. How much work were you able to reuse or build upon from the 2011 and 2019 DP group? Um, I can I can take that question. So um, the one of the reason why we said it was DigiPres 1.0 and DigiPres 2.0 was that there was actually just um, entire facilitators were rotated out. So Brenna, I joined DigiPres around 2020, and then Brenna came on 2021, and Christy 2022. So um, it was it was kind of restart kind of from the beginning. And to my knowledge, there wasn't any documentation from the past facilitators, except some old email threads mm -hmm. that we could have gone off of. Thanks. Um, another question for Emmeline. Uh, I'd be curious to know how you are approaching duplicates in your appraisal workflow. Oh, good question. Thank you for this one. Um, duplicates are actually something that I, or exact duplicates are something that I have actually identified as like a criteria for technical appraisal. So it's something that the format script um, does catch and uh, aggregates in like a tab in that script. So I will be able to see a list of everything that has the same checksum information. So we go off of, um, yeah, checksum to identify exact duplicates. And in terms of like myself appraising duplicates, um, I tend to kind of have to use best judgment on that and see 
uh, whether that's something that I want to address initially or whether there might be something about the way those duplicates have been organized that, that warrants a follow-up with the collecting archivist. But that is something that, that I do watch for and can potentially appraise out in that first phase of technical appraisal. Great, thanks. So we've got some discussion in the chat. Um, always be documenting and keep documentation. Make sure they are known when a committee ends, people rotate off. Uh, this kind of documentation should be added to a record schedule for the organization. Absolutely, Kari. Um, while folks are uh, are thinking of questions uh, to write in the Q and A, I also have a question for uh, Brenna Hyung and Christy. What challenges do you foresee when forming a local digital preservation group? Yeah, so one of the challenges is figuring out who's doing the work at each of the libraries and institutions on campus. Um, some people it's not spelled out in their official title. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. Um, and also widening out the scope to invite those who aren't listed under the libraries, for example, Christy, uh, I reached out when we, whenever I started in 2020, trying to figure out who the other digital archivists were. And I reached out to her and one of her colleagues to be like, hey, I want to talk and figure out what you're doing. So um, yeah, figuring out who to contact and who would be interested that wasn't already on this um, old listserv list and then going through and cleaning out that listserv list. That and also trying to get the students involved since we do have an iSchool here, um, trying to be like, come see, if you're interested in this, come see what we talk about once we're in the real world, real world with quotes, um, and making it a welcoming space and making it a uh, space where people want to share is a challenge. Uh, Christy, you know, if you have any other comments. Yeah, and adding on to what just what Brenna just said, um, I think another challenge is just figuring out what we want to do, because um, I feel like this is kind of played out in a lot of archival groups where everything's on fire, so we have to like everything is all, all important, and we have to pick one because we can't devote our time to everything. So I think that's another challenge when we meet together, it's like coming up with something to do that has meaningful impact. Yeah, this makes me think of a topic from the earlier great question session about building capacity within our institutions. Do you see this as also pulling in more staff who are uh, folks who are sort of tangentially related to digital archives but are interested in, um, in, in getting more of that experience and hopefully growing capacity in the field? Yes, Alice. Um, I mean, I... I really enjoyed Emmeline's um, presentation because um, we have like oftentimes um, digital archivists, um, you, you are the only digital archivist in the institution. So there's no way for one person to do everything. And I think um, using this kind of community to kind of bring more folks in and kind of make them aware of like what is the kind of challenge that we're facing. And that kind of, even, even with the just one uh, attendance, they can get kind of just on what is being kind of talked about. So um, yeah, I think it, it, it'll be a good opportunity. Thank you. Um, so I have a question from the Q&A. Uh, have you had any difference of opinions with the collecting archivist on weeding 
files deemed not accepted during the technical appraisal, or is there any tension in this process? Um, sorry, that was a question for Emily. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, I think that we were able to sort of prevent this tension by having a meeting in advance of implementing this process where I actually brought technical appraisal criteria, uh, just like a list of what I was thinking about and discussed it with the collecting archivist that I was gonna be working with. So it was based on, the, the criteria were based on what I had been seeing in collections, it was based a bit on the format report results out of our digital preservation system. And it was sort of like, here's what I'm thinking, are, I'm not ever planning to appraise out things that a donor would have created. These are things that are very much focused on like system generated files or application generated files and uh, just being very upfront about what my criteria look like. And we talked through them and sort of decided on that list. And I have, uh, I have documentation for it that are like guidelines for technical appraisal that are you know, in a shared location and are things that we, we will likely periodically update, um, but this is new enough, we've only done it the one time, but I think having that, uh, that conversation up front was super helpful. Thanks. Um, Follow-up question, uh, what tools or data sources do you use to identify formats and determine their risk level? So our um, format analysis script currently uses the Harvard FITS tool, the file information tool set, which I actually have a link, um, which is sort of like an aggregate tool or a tool that aggregates a bunch of different format identification tools. Um, so that's our primary format identification tool. I feel like I've said that three times, but um, we also use the uh, National Archives and Records Administration's uh, Digital Preservation Risk Matrix as our primary source of format risk data. So that is something that's available through the National Archives um, GitHub, which I also have a link to. So this is our um, primary source of, of risk data. So those are kind of our two main data sources that way. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question for uh, Brenna, Hyung, and Christy. Um, so what resources do you need to achieve a common minimum? Time. <laughs> um, mainly the time to do it which was a really nice part about this group and focusing in on this is like creating the time to come to that uh at pointing out where our common minimum should be but also to get to it that varies based on the institution um and we say institution even though we're all under ut because we are all sort of separated um and so support from our supervisors, support from each other across campus to show that, hey, this is a thing they're doing. We want to do it too. Um, and so probably lots of documentation, honestly. Um, uh, I'm gonna let Christy and Hyung answer or add anything to that as well. No, I think, um, Brenna, you got it right. Um, basically, time. And that's something we're trying to use the UT DigiPress group to kind of make a space for it so people can use it as an opportunity to get things on. And as well as we are trying to have kind of shared front to kind of convince our colleagues and convince administration that why this is why certain things are needed and as well as um, like Brenna mentioned try to kind of use peer pressure to um, make some movements on um, some of the areas so yes I feel like oh sorry I was just gonna say I feel like I should add we have gotten some interest 
in our work from um, other groups on campus and um, to talk with them and figure out like the best way forward to implement these and like really keep going up levels um, of the levels of preservation, digital preservation. Um, so we started conversations, so we'll see where they end up, but at least the conversation has been started and interest has been shown beyond just the DigiPress group. Great, thank you. I um, want to draw attention to a conversation in the chat. Uh, would be interested to know how you pull together information from bits into a report or a summary that is useful for a human. And then Emily does drop the link to the GitHub. Thank you for that. Um, we'll definitely be looking at that. The script to uh, run fits and compares it to a NARA format risk analysis or risk matrix. So, folks have any more questions, please drop them in the, the Q&A. Um, do have another question for Emily. Uh, can you provide examples of technical appraisal notes that you give to collecting archivists? Sure. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, my notes are based on the fact that I'm sort of going to be looking at these files quite a bit um, after they're received during my technical appraisal process. So it's an opportunity for me to kind of identify anything that I want to draw the collecting archivist's attention to. So that can occasionally um, that can occasionally include areas that look like they might have um, PII risk or uh, yeah sensitive information. So any folders that are conspicuously named or um, data that I found that I think maybe the donor didn't intend to give us, um, and just sort of say, is this something that you're aware of? Is this something that we want to keep? Also, if there's a large amount of data that um, is likely out of scope, so if somebody accidentally gives us their entire iTunes library, it's a heads up to just say, hey, I found a whole iTunes library um, right here, just in case you want to get rid of that or <laughs> you want to decide what to do with that. Um, then it also is an opportunity to uh, let them know about potential processing, or I guess, yeah, just complications with processing. Um, so if I come across uh, a bunch of, you know, old database files that I'm not familiar with and I know are going to take a certain amount of research and time to sort of figure out how to access and then provide access to those files, it's an opportunity for me to let them know as well that, hey, I found, you know, 200 of these kinds of files. If this is something you want to keep, this is going to require a bunch of additional research and processing time. And um, I am the sort of the only person processing Born Digital for these two libraries right now. So being able to be transparent about the labor requirements for certain collections uh, is really useful and kind of keeps everybody on the same page about like what these workflows involve. Um, so that has been a, a very helpful way to just communicate. Um, if you're interested in keeping this, this is not something that I have an established process for, and I'm going to need to do do some upfront work in order to um, make these files preservable. Great, thank you, Emily. Um, so if anybody has additional questions, please add them to the Q&A. Uh, there is a note in the chat, looks like a comment about appraisal all the way down. Terrific to explicitly reflect the relationships between specific technical decisions and appraisal strategies based on core professional values. Totally agree. Any additional questions or questions from the uh, panelists to each other? Not a question, but a quick comment. Um, really love all the documentation uh, from UGA. It's really great and I'm excited to read through it. 
Thank you. Digital stewardship is a big fan of documentation. <laughs> Loved your presentation, by the way. Yeah, plus one to amazing documentation. Thank you for all the links. Well, I think I'm gonna, I will hand it back to Kari. Okay, so um, thank you all so much for this really great session. Um, particular thanks to Brenna, Young, Christy, and Emmeline for sharing their work with us, and thanks to Alice for moderating the Q&A session.